welcome you to uh, this introductory game for the DVD. Now I thought then rather than throwing you in at the deep end with the interactive stuff immediately, we'd just uh, have a look at one of Tao's most famous victories um, against the current world champion when he played this. He was the current world champion, uh, Michael Bovnik. And uh, this, this game was a great game, a very interesting game. You had two opposing sort of players in this world championship match. I mean, this is, this is when basically by winning this title match, Tao became the world champion. Um, but he was up against Bovnik, who was basically renowned for his classical strong play. I mean, the guy was a very principled player. On the other hand, you had this crazy guy, Tao, coming along who was uh, completely opposite, really, to Bovenik, who was now challenging him for the world title. So, generally, when you're playing chess, it's very important to remember about the psychological strong points that you have and that your opponent has. So, what Tao wanted to do in these games was, again, create ca chaos at the board to get his opponent out of the classical way of playing, while Bovenik would have been very happy just to keep things under control and try to keep a, a safe advantage. So, um, so, this is a very, very interesting world championship match. And, uh, I mean, later while reflecting on the match, I mean, Bovenik went on to lose this, uh, this important match and uh, lose his title. I mean, he basically s said about uh, Tao uh, that he was staggered by the fact that instead of playing by position, as I taught myself back in my youth, my opponent would make a seemingly illogical move. His logic had a strictly practical point, though, um, to set the opponent difficult troubles. And when the opponent went wrong, Tao would find elegant and unexpected solutions. So basically this is what Tao did during this match. He really created as many problems as he could for Bovnik and tried to get him out of his crazy, crazy game. So, I mean, Tao's style was basically to sort of throw all the pieces in the air and sort of hope they land on the board and work out, but in a very calculated and intuitive way. So he wouldn't do anything... It, I mean, it looked like it was complete chaos the way he played, but it's actually very sensible the way he played. I mean, in his own kind of mad way, if that makes sense. Like I said in the introduction, um, kind of chaos, but ordering chaos. That was his style. That's the way he played. So let's move on to the game. In this game, Bovnik was white and Tao was black. This was the sixth game of this World Championship match. I believe that before this, all the games were... Uh, drawn up to this point, so very important game. Whoever gets the first blood in the match has obviously got a big advantage. And uh, Tao was playing the black pieces, so it's a sixth game. And it's kind of a prime example of Tao's style of play and his risky approach to the game. So it's a very good way to get you introduced to this interactive DVD. I mean, hopefully by going over this game, you're gonna get a feeling for what you should be looking for when you get to the interactive part of this DVD. Um, so, I mean, this, to me, this game shows, like, pure, brutal energy, really, and compiled with, a, you know, kind of an insane imagination. And um, by doing that, like I mentioned before, you can kind of overcome the strict guidelines that should control chess. Or well, that's what Tao did anyway. Probably one of the only people in the world who could get, get away with uh, such brash moves. So, the game started C4. So, Bovnik was quite famed for playing this move, quite positional approach to the game. Knight F6... Knight to f3, and now g6. So this is called the King's Indian Defence when you play g6, so I'm sure most of you will know about, and it's a good way to start the game. It suits Tao's style perfectly. I mean, Tao's a very, uh, as we said, complicated and messy player, so he wants to play an aggressive opening. The King's Indian Defence is a very aggressive opening. So Bovnik played g3. So this is one of the, the calmest ways of meeting the King's Indian. Rather than grabbing the centre immediately with d4 and e4, Bovnik just wants to try to keep things a bit under control. So it's the Fianchetto variation. Um, so after g3, bishop to g7. So continue a bit more. Bishop to g2. Tau castled. Pawn to d4. So it's a standard position. Um, d6 was played. Knight to c3. So both sides are developing their pieces very sensibly here. And there's a couple of ways that black can play against this system. Now, a modern approach nowadays is to play knight to c6 here. And often, after d5, you play knight to a5, and you follow this up with some plan with c5. So this is quite a modern way of playing. And there's a number of, number of decent moves here, but knight to c6 is considered the main line. Tau actually played knight on b to d7 here. So his, his main idea, he wants to continue in standard fashion with e5. 
So potentially he's got some, if he can go e5 and later e4, he might be able to get some attacking chances against the white king, which would be perfect for him. So castles. Pawn to e5 was played. Pawn to e4. And now Tau played pawn to c6. So this is quite a useful move to play, pawn to c6. You make a bit of room for your queen here. And uh, after d5, you have the option of opening up the c file. Some cases you can even keep the c, the c file closed as c5, but probably opening up the c file is better. So now h3 was played. Um, so bishop e3 has actually been played in the past by Bovnik, but um, after bishop to e3, you're kind of asking for uh, this move knight to g4 to be played. I mean, it's a very pr provocative move, and one thing you don't want to do against Tau is provoke the guy. You know, you don't need to provoke the guy, he's a complete nutter anyway, so why provoke the guy? Just wait until he goes crazy is a very good way of playing against someone like this, you know. Don't provoke him, because he's going to come at you anyway. This kind of move is very provoking, because knight g4, here we come, I'm going to attack your bishop. So, much, I mean, this is why I'm sure Bolnik didn't play this, this way. I mean, okay, one line here that I think Smyslov had against Tau, another very good player, was bishop to g5, queen to b6, and already this queen's attacking a couple of targets, d4 and b2. And, uh, well, basically, black's got very active play here. Uh, Smyslov played h3, and then I believe that some, uh, there was some crazy line now where Tau took on d4, and after knight to a4, he just moved his queen somewhere, with an extremely complicated position. But, okay, I mean, this is, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, but this is just the kind of thing you, you want to try to avoid unless you know exactly what you're doing. So let's go back to the position and see what Bovnik played instead of bishop to e3. Okay, so he didn't go bishop to e3. He played pawn to h3 here. So this is a more Bovnik style way of playing. Uh, let's stop knight g4. Let's just keep things under control. I'll try to keep some kind of advantage away. I've got a space advantage in the centre, so I don't need to provoke Tau. Okay, queen to b6 has played. Tau's looking immediately for active play on the queen side in this variation. Pawn to d5. There's some other options here. Uh, I mean, rook to e1 is very sensible. Um, but then you basically, the typical idea here, King's Indian idea, is to go take the pawn on d4, and after knight takes d4, just play rook to e8. And uh, this puts a bit of pressure against the pawn on e4. Knight to c5 follows up with the idea maybe a5, a4. And you try to get some active play your bishop on the long diagonal. And also the a-pawn can be quite annoying running down the, the board to try to loosen white up on, the, on that side of the board. Okay, so rook to e1 is uh, one possibility. Uh, this wasn't played in the game. Another possibility instead of rook to e1 is pawn to c5. But again, this makes things very complicated, pawn to c5. Okay, I mean, after, for example, d takes c5. D takes E5. The position has become more complicated, so this is one thing that Bovnik, playing against his crazy man, Mantel, wants to avoid. Don't complicate the position. Try to keep it calm. So this, this, would, be, this would be quite a, a bad choice to play against him. So Bovnik tries to keep, keep things under control. So he goes D5, keeping the position closed, trying to keep Tau controlled. Don't give Tau a chance to go crazy. C takes D5 was played. C takes d5, so let's get on to a bit more of a critical position here. Knight to c5. So black's pieces have found good squares. Both the knights on c5 and f6 hitting the pawn on e4. Uh, the queen on b6 is quite well placed and ready to develop our last piece, the bishop. But white has good control over the centre of the board. This formation of pawn on e4 and d5 gives them a space advantage. So knight to e1. So this is uh, quite a slow move. Uh, but it does defend the pawn on e4, and white wants to basically exchange off the strong knight on c5. So it, it, makes, it makes quite a lot of sense as well. Bishop to d7, last piece comes into the game. Knight to d3, and black's really forced to exchange this knight at some point. Okay, maybe he could consider playing rook to c8 here, but uh, he just decided to take on d3. So knight takes d3, queen takes d3. So everything actually looks very calm. Uh, in this position so far and in some ways this position to me would seem to favour Bovnik because Tau's been kept under control so far his pieces haven't got a lot of life to them they're kind of a bit suffocating at the moment so at the moment I'd probably fancy Bovnik in this position but this quickly changes 
Uh, I mean, this is probably one of the most critical moments of the game. I mean, what this is now when Black's played all his natural moves. So later on, when we come to the interactive stop part of the of the game, we're going to give you options in a position like this. How would you continue? What would be your plan here? Black's played obvious moves, so what should you do to continue? What would Tao do? What would this guy do? And you're not allowed to go out and have a cigarette like he might do. Okay, you have to try to work this out. So what would he do in this position? Well, there's a couple of plans here. I mean, a very logical move here would be to try to get the F-pawn running down the board. I mean, this would be very logical and probably what I'd uh, try to play here. I mean, let's have a look at one line. I mean, knight to e e8, try to go F5, very sensible idea. Uh, but then after knight to e8, this gives white the option to play bishop to e3. And this queen on b6 really has to retreat. Much too risky to take the pawn on b2. The queen's in danger of being trapped. So, for example, queen to d8 now, played, queen retreats. Rook to ac1, and now we get this f5 breaking. So this is a typical break for the king's Indian defence. Black often relies on this f5 move to gain counterplay on the king's side. But here, white's got a very standard way of meeting this uh, this advance. And if you're if you're playing, your opponent plays this f5 move, the next plan is well worth remembering. How do we stop black from playing f4 and gaining very good counterplay on the king's side? Well, the typical response here, and a very good response to f5, is e takes f5, and after e takes f5, still wanting to go e4 or f4, white now plays pawn to f4. And this basically stops all of black's counterplay on the king's side. Um, okay, I mean, black can play pawn to e4 here, but then when the queen retreats, so let's say queen to d2, um, black's now got a rigid pawn formation. The pawn on e4 and f5, uh, very rigid, unflexible. You can't push them at all. So this is um, the kind of position that I think Bobnik would be even more happier with because a lot of dynamism has been sucked out of the position and you don't want to leave tower dynamism in the position. So again, this knight to e8 doesn't quite look good enough. Now another option would have been knight to h5. This actually would have been a very good option as well. Um, but this is slightly more active than the last line if we go back to the position in question. Uh, knight to h5 instead of what Tao played in the game. Again, this is quite this is quite a good idea. We won't go into details of that, but it's a, another good option. But Tao actually now played with the queen on b6, rook on f to c8. So the rook just came over to the c-file and we're ready to put pressure on white's uh, queen side here. So um, apparently at this moment in the game, Tao stated in his book, his great book, My Life and Times, I have to admit that at this point already, I was... Uh, already seized with the idea of the knight sacrifice on f4, which, however, was still very hazy. How on earth did he even comprehend this knight sacrifice on f4 here? I mean, it's very difficult to see how this knight can get to f4 and this will actually benefit black. So, I mean, this just goes to show his his great imagination that he already had some idea of knight to f4 in this position, which looks very hard to see. So, OK, so the game continued rook to b1. So... This defends the pawn on b2. Knight to h5. So now he plays his knight to h5. So his idea, okay, he might still consider this pawn to f5, but he does have other ideas on this knight to f4. Crazy idea. Maybe knight to f4 in this position, it's probably not quite good enough at the moment, but later on it might well become good enough. Bishop to e3. Natural move, attack, pushing the queen away. Now, Again, this is an important moment. One, one thing that Tao will always tend to do, and this is one thing you're going to have to remember when the critical moments come up later on, Tao doesn't like moving backwards. He likes going forwards, he doesn't like going backwards. He's a bit like a samurai. He won't retreat, he'll just come straight at you. If he can move forwards, he will move forwards. If he can keep his pieces active, he will keep his pieces active. He's basically going to come at you. So this is one thing, try to remember later on, when you've got these interactive options, Always look for the most active move and don't retreat unless you have to. This is not a, a Petrosian DVD, this is a Tau DVD. So, in this position, obviously Tau played queen to b4, active square, moving forwards. Much better way to play. Um, okay, so queen to e2 was now played. So, um, I guess the reason for this is that you want to overprotect the pawn on b2. Um, and also, you're attacking the knights on h5. This is probably the main point. So if black now goes f5, well, white can just take this pawn on f5. And um, black can no longer go g takes f5 because the knight on h5 drops. So this is probably a reason. And one thing is, if, if black ever plays bishop takes f5, this is not normally ideal because white now has control of the e4 square and g, g4 is sometimes an option. 
So, okay, so let's go back. Queen to e2 was played. Rook to c4. So again, another typical town move. He's moving forwards, activating every piece to its full potential. He wants to double up on the c-file. f5 was an option, but okay. I think that uh, this is what white wanted black to play. Let's get all our pieces as active as possible. I mean, Tao wouldn't just play tactics for the crazy idea of playing tactics. He'd only do it when his pieces are taking up good roles already. It's exactly what he does here. Okay, so rook on f to c1, over defending some of these weaknesses. Rook on a to c8. King to h2, so another Bovenik idea, classical chess, try to keep the king side under control as solid as possible. So what should black do here? Well, black's, let's look at his pieces to start with. The rook's very active, the queen very active, knight on h5, quite active. Bishop on g7, not so good, so we need to try to do some break. So now it's time to play f5. So this is actually what black Tau did in this game. I mean, it's rather anti-positional because after e takes f5, Bishop takes f5. Again, we can't go g takes the knight on h5 drops. Bishop takes f5. I mean, I mentioned before that this is positionally okay for white. <coughs> but by playing this, black has activated another piece, his light square bishop. We're attacking the rook on b1. So we're getting some very active play here. And now rook to a1 was played. Now, this is the critical moment. I mean, okay, a3 was a better move here because we're trying to force the pieces away now. For example... If the queen now goes to b3, um, we have, I believe, an option of going knight to e4 here with some tactics available. I won't go too deeply into them, just to let you know that if bishop takes e4, bishop takes e4, rook takes e4, rook takes c8, wins a rook. So this would have been a good way to try to stop the activity of um, basically uh, black's activity here. But OK, rook to a1 was played. And now this is a very important moment of the game, and maybe the match... In entire, entirety. Uh, in this position, black's got a number of options here. I mean, uh, Kasparov in his book recommends that black should probably just play knight to f6 here because um, g4 is a threat. And uh, when black's got a very harmonious position. But this is Tau we're talking about. And Tau all of a sudden plays a bolt from the blue. And uh, this may not be entirely sound his play, but it does sum up Tau's character and his play. So maybe you want to consider what Tau played. I mean, why you consider Tau's option in this position? Um, I'm just going to say this is a great way to play against Bovnik because, again, he's trying to muddy the waters. Um, this was a strength for Tao's play. I mean, psychologically, he would be very strong. He'd try to play against his opponent's typical way of thinking. Um, I mean, it was, it's worth noting that after this move was played, there was commotion in the auditorium. This is back in the good old days of Soviet chess when, um, you know, chess was a main event. It was like going to a football match in England or something, you know, you have fans everywhere, there'd be massive followings for these matches. Just, to, just imagine this, put yourself in this environment. You're Tao, this young guy who's renowned to be a little bit against the establishment, you know, and he's playing for the World Championship match. He's playing black against Bovnik, you know, the established classical player. And um, it's this big, really emotional thing with all the, play, all the spectators getting exciting. And after his next move, it's commentated that basically... Disciplined Soviet chess fans who have already seen Bovnik play four matches were so excited by Tao's play they began applauding, noisily talking and even shouting. So, I mean, Bovnik was apparently obviously upset and irritated by these distractions. So this is the kind of effect Tao's play would have. He could actually make people start shouting on the chessboard. I mean, how often do you get that in a chess tournament? I mean, I haven't seen that happen often. The British Championships, no, heard no one shouting, unfortunately. Not over any of the games now. This is what we need to bring back, I think. A bit more, a bit more football shouting at the chess matches, you know. Come on, you towel. Come on, you towel. We'll have something like that coming in. That would make it a lot more entertaining. Probably wouldn't be to everyone's cup of tea, but it would uh, maybe make things entertaining. So what was this movie play? Knight to F4. Bang. So... This sacrifices a knight. Okay, well, white's pretty much forced to take on f4. And uh, now e takes f4. And Tao's basically given up a whole piece. Does he care? Well, I don't think he's that bored. I mean, the whole point of this unleashes a bishop on g7. We've weakened white's kingside. And we have a monster pawn on f4 here. I mean, look at this pressure against a c3 square. This is really big pressure over here, along the long diagonal in general. But it has cost a piece. And, it, and this is not actually the best way to play, but it's typical Tau. 
I mean, he's managed to create a lot of problems for his opponent. Now, in this position, I mean, as we've already noted, I mean, imagine if you're Bovnik, you hear all the, all the fans cheering for your opponent, and you're under this pressure. I mean, it's noted that Bovnik was going redder and redder during this match, you know, like, a, like he's about to explode at one point because he just couldn't cope with all these complications. Now, he actually has a very good defence here. In the game, he played bishop to d2. Now, he should have gone pawn to a3, which is tactically... Uh, very complicated. I'm not going to go into the variations because I don't think they're particularly irrelevant. So I want to go through to the, the, the main interactive part. But this is the way you should play. Again, when your opponent's pieces, I mean, just as a general rule, your opponent's pieces are very active. You want to try to push them away to less active squares. So this A3 move would achieve that. It pushed the queen away to a less active squares. So A3 should have been the move that was played. But bishop to D2 was played. Okay. And in this position, actually... Um, Tau play queen takes b2, but um, he actually recorded on his score sheet bishop to e5 here, which would have been a stronger move. So even Tau was not playing perfectly, even at this moment in time. But let's get on. Uh, queen takes b2 was played, so he's now got two pawns for the piece. And in this position, okay, white played rook on a to b1. So he's trying to give back some material to calm down Tau's initiative. Now, after the next move, the noise in the hall now reached its peak. Around here it was noted that red spots started to appear on Bovenik's face. Well, I, I also know that feeling. I mean, I've had some games like when I've been on demonstration boards and um, I've blundered a piece and all of a sudden I, I will go the colour of my hair. I'll just go tomato-like. And it's very embarrassing. The sweat will start dripping off and I just want to get... Just want to get out of the hall. So it's exactly what's happened in Bovnik here. After Tau's next move, he completely missed the next move. I mean, I think he was relying on bishop takes b1. When uh, We'll have a quick look at the variation. Bishop takes b1. Rook takes b1. And now in this position, uh, let's, for example, say uh, queen to c2 is played. Queen to c2 looks a very logical move. And now Bovnik would have had a very good uh, idea in this position. Bishop to e4. And uh, the black queen's in a lot of trouble. Okay, we can try some sacrifice. Uh, sacrifice this piece. Rook takes e4. Queen takes e4. But now the black king is looking extremely, extremely weak here. Um, for example, if queen takes d2. Queen to e6 check. Picks up the rook on c8. So Bovnik is just clearly winning here. And this is the line that Bovnik's actually uh, relying on in this position. He's relying on Tau grabbing material. But, uh, I mean, Tau's the opposite of today's capitalist kind of way of thinking. I think if Tao, I mean, I'm sure Tao would have given a lot of money to charity the way he plays chess. He would have burnt a lot of wood on the chessboard. He doesn't like grabbing pieces, he likes giving away pieces. So what did Tao play here? F3. Bang. His queen's on pre, but he's going to attack the other queen. Now, what is the point of this move, you wonder? Well, the idea is to displace some of White's pieces and open up this diagonal towards Black's king, the b8, h2 diagonal. So f3 was played, and now Bovenik cracked again. He went rook takes queen here, which actually goes loses to a very bad position. He should have gone in this position, instead of rook takes b2, he should have played bishop takes f3. Now this is a safer option, and this is still probably okay for White, you know. Uh, let's have a look at one line. I mean, bishop takes b1 now. I mean, basic Tau's just bamboozled Bovenik. This is what he's done. Completely bamboozled the guy, poor guy. You even feel sorry for Bovenik here. Rook takes b1, queen to c2, and now Bovenik has an amazing resource in this position. Um, White can re-sacrifice here. Now, it's slightly different now that this f-pawn's gone. It gives black more possibilities. He all has gained a tempo bishop to e5 check compared to the last line we looked at. But Bovenik in this position can play bishop to e4, which is a brilliant move because it involves a, a re-sacrifice of material. For example, now, rook takes e4 is forced, otherwise the black queen is trapped. Knight takes e4. So this seems to leave the rook on b1 on pre, which it obviously does. So now Tau plays queen takes b1. So Tau is now the exchange up, but his king is in mortal danger. The knight on e4 is such a strong piece. Knight takes d6 is now the best option for white. And we can see the knight's attacking the rook. The queen's coming to e6. I mean, one basic checkmate kind of uh, tactic here would be rook to f8, queen to e6 check, 
king to h8, knight to f7, check. Now, okay, if, if rook takes knight, we go queen takes rook. And uh, white's definitely got advantage with this monster past d pawn. And, you know, the typical idea, king to g8, we've got this smothered mate now. Knight to h6, check. King to h8, and now one of the most beautiful mates in, check, in chess. Queen to g8, check. Black's only got one move, rook takes, g8, and now knight to f7, checkmate. So, obviously a very complicated line, but it's not clear. I mean, this is kind of um, what Tao does. I mean, the lines he played might be losing, but we saw just how difficult that was for Bovenik to work out. And Bovenik is not really renowned for his sacrificial play. This is the other point to his uh, style of play. So Tao... Maybe even Tao saw that Bovnik could play this, but he maybe gambled in a slight way that practically Bovnik wouldn't have found this uh, variation. So this is this is one potential idea. So that I mean, this could have changed the whole match. Maybe this could have even you know this would have won Bovnik the game possibly if he'd have found this re-sacrifice of uh, knights to bishop to e4, which has pretty much forced that position anyway. So it's really just calculation. So after pawn to f3. This rook takes b2, which was played, is a mistake. He should go for this bishop takes f3 when, who knows, if he maybe he could have retained his world championships match. Who knows? So let's have a look at the way things finished off. Rook takes b2 was a mistake because now Tao took on e2. So he's still a piece down, but his pieces are incredibly active now. Bishops, monsters, rooks and monsters. Pawn on e2 is a fawn in white side. Rook to Okay, rook to uh, b3 is now played. Have to defend the knight on c3, horribly tied up. Rook to d4, good move. Again, keep attacking. Tao's not going to move backwards, he's going to keep attacking. So remember this later on when you get the chance to do your active moves. Intractive choice, are you going to go back? I hope not. You're going to keep going forwards. Bishop to e1, horribly passive move. Bishop to e5, check. And basically, it's very bad now. For white, king to g1, bishop to f4. Now, it's surprising Tao played this. It still wins, but Tao had a much stronger way to win here. He could actually play the tactical break. Rook takes c3, which would really uh, put white in a lot of trouble here. Um, after, for example, rook on b takes c3, we have rook to d1. And it's not really any way that white's going to survive this. For example, rook to c4, we have the very nice move. Bishop to b2, and all of white's pieces are uh, are basically in trouble there. So this would have been a much cleaner way to win the game. I'll only show you a couple more moves because we've come to basically the, the moments of the game I wanted to talk about here. Uh, I want to get onto the interactive part of the DVD so we can give you a chance of uh, basically finding these moves and uh, see if you can play like Tao. So he played bishop to f4, and let's just get to a bit of clarification. After knight takes e2... Rook takes c1, knight takes d4, rook takes e1, check, bishop to f1, bishop to e4. And we can stop here, basically. I mean, this is a technical winning position for black. Two bishops are known for being stronger than a knight. These two bishops on e4 and f4, complete monsters, dominate the board. In this position, actually, black is also pawn up. Bishops combine very well with the rook. So the bishops combining with the rook, very good. White's bishop on f1, tied down, very passive. Okay, I mean, uh, if he goes, rook takes b7 here. Black just plays bishop to d3, so this would be a very simple win. Basically, the game is over. So let's just um, basically have a quick chat about this game and think what's went wrong for White there. Well, I think this show basically Tao's psychology that he could very good at mixing things up and his opponent even though his opponent had good defensive options in that game he still didn't find the right defences so basically practical play is one of the strengths of Tao's thing attacking chess another strength these amazing possibilities that he saw this idea of going knight f4 on such a way away he didn't even go f5 he actually played on the queen side so activating your pieces putting your pieces in the most active squares don't attack, very good rule, don't attack until all your pieces are very well placed because attack's not going to work until your pieces are positioned well. So, very good game. I mean, attacking, basically as a rule, is easier than defending. So, this is one thing that you've got to take with you for the rest of the match, the rest of the, the DVD. Um, so, this is just a little introduction to his play. Uh, hopefully give you an idea of the way he does play. It's a very attacking, very aggressive chess.
very entertaining chess, and this is what you're going to have to now do. Your aim now is to play like Tao. Um, I'm going to help you along as you go, but you've really got to get into the brain set of Tao over the board. I wouldn't recommend you really copy his lifestyle. I mean, Kasparov didn't recommend you do that either, but okay, you can do if you want to get your cigar and vodka and things like this out. It's, it's up to you. Not to be recommended while you're playing in a tournament, of course. But it, we're going to come to the interactive parts in a moment. And remember, forwards play. Don't be scared. Play actively. And hopefully this DVD will improve your attacking chess and even your outlook of some possibilities that you can get in chess. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the DVD. Let's go on to the interactive part.